right, so let us move forward in this very interesting and insightful key session, keynote, uh, we shall be talking about the opportunities to scale and getting value from AI. And for this, ladies and gentlemen, we are absolutely thrilled to have the CTO of Kendril, Mr. Sri Krishnan Venkateshwaran, over here with us. Can I please have a round of applause as I welcome Mr. Sri Krishnan Venkateshwaran on here, the stage, please. So, my name is Krishnan Venkateshwaran. I'm the uh, CTO for Kindrel India. And um, Kindrel is a spin-off of IBM, and we are two years old. Um, we are the largest technology services company in the world, uh, about 4,500 customers worldwide, 350 in India, um, doing exciting stuff over the last two years. And today I have a, a very interesting uh, topic for you uh, around uh, generative AI. And the speciality of today is that um, Chat GPT exactly turns one year old today. So it was on 30th of November around this time that we, uh, OpenAI um, unveiled uh, uh, this technology called uh, Chat GPT. And in a short span of about 12 months, it has upended the world of technology. It has um, created deep disruptions and it is it's starting to touch everyday lives, right? So, and over this time, uh, we at Kindrel, we have also been experimenting um, with generative AI and um, uh, we have implemented generative AI use cases both for um, our internal needs as well as for uh, to solve client problems. So we have a mix of both and uh, we have done about you know six applications in, in generative AI and in today's talk in the next 20 minutes I'm going to take you through um, those stories yeah our journey around generative AI and, and, and what we have been what we have achieved so far and our learnings and experiments and experiences. So, so that's the, uh, you know, agenda for today. So, you know, I'll start with a, um, a, a word about how generative AI is shaping the future of, of this country. Yeah. Um, how is uh, um, India and its future being influenced by, uh, you know, generative AI? Now, AI in general, as we all know, democratizes, and this is an opportunity for us to leapfrog all our lackings uh, in technology over the, over the last few years. And very interesting st uh, statistics from Niti Aayog, so what they say is, if, if, if India grows at a sustained pace of 10% uh, from today for the next 24 years till um, 19, uh, 2047, our economy, our GDP is going to hit 32 trillion US dollars. Now, if we grow only at about six, six and a half percent, over the same period, our GDP will touch only 12 trillion dollars. So this is the, the reverse power of compounding, so to speak. And 33 trillion is going to lift vast sections of the population outside poverty. Uh, so it's, it's a huge difference. And to achieve the sustained growth of 10 percent, which countries like China and South Korea have done in the, in the last, uh, latter part of the last century, we can't rely on traditional technologies like garments and food processing and so on. So we have to pole vault in sunrise technologies, which includes AI and which includes generative AI and other experiential technologies. So Gen AI is going to be key for us to catapult our way into the top two uh, uh, in the world in terms of uh, GDP as well as to, to lift uh, India, all of India from, from poverty. That is how important it is. And to successfully navigate the, the AI wave, we need, you need two things. One is data, right? Vast data sets. And the other is skills. And India is fortunate to be blessed with both. So we have vast data sets and, and we have skills. In fact, data says that um, in terms of mobile data consumption, India is now number one in the world. So that's, that's how much data uh, you know, we, we possess. So we, we start from an advantage. And we know that in, in 2023, AI is, uh, you know, permeating industries and generative AI is already there live. It's in production. So whether you book a ticket, indigo.com has such a, a Gen AI enabled chatbot, Air India has one, Indian Railways, IRCTC has one, and Swiggy is going to release one uh, in, the, in the next couple of months and so on. So it's already, uh, you know, touching uh, our, our daily lives. Now, the, the, the special thing about Gen AI compared to classical AI is that 
in classical AI, the, the pattern that has been observed worldwide, including uh, the researchers such as Gartner, is that um, you know, the infusion of AI is often in inversely proportional to the number of skills needed and number of resources needed. So th there would be an area, uh, AI seeps in and then, you know, there is a, a, a dip in terms of the number of, uh, you know, skills needed. But with Gen AI, what has been observed is that the so-called uh, hype of disillusionment is, 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 is not really there anymore and they call it a step function growth because Gen AI is getting infused with so many facets, you know, right from observability to uh, um, uh, code generation and, and search and so on. So it's there everywhere. So you're, what you're seeing is actually a step function growth. So it's, it's, it's so there is really, it is really the, an anti-pattern to what we see with classical AI. So that is, you know, special about, uh, about generative AI. And now, um, you know, at Kindrill, yeah, we have been... Um, there have been two areas, right? Two first order changes uh, uh, that we are seeing with generative AI. One is in search, and the other one um, is around code generation. So these are the, the, the two main aspects. And just to touch on both, and after this, I'm going to give you the user, the client use cases that we are, we are developing. So the first is around search, right? So there was a time uh, just 12 months back when search was commodity, it was considered free. There was no budget in, uh, uh, you know, uh, for corporates for search, right? It was just there. But today, search is part of boardroom conversations. Uh, uh, the board um, is debating how uh, search can reach new customers, new kinds of customers, change and touch and transform core business models and so on. So what's happening is search is now elevated to conversations in natural language, right? And then you go on to a reasoning engine. So earlier I said we have all vast amounts of data. So we have been digitizing like, like crazy and we have been populating databases. But we did not have an analytical engine to access that data and create, you know, cognitive uh, recent capabilities so far, right? So now what has changed is that with this technology and with the amount of, you know, uh, data that we have, you, you can get advisors that can read your intent. So, and, and then the second aspect is the vast progress in natural language processing over the last 12 months. So with these two, Right, the semantic search that uh, earlier ruled the roost is today gone to the level of um, cognitive conversations, right? Reasoning engines, um, creative consultants. Right? They are all creative consultants. So this is the this is the state that we have reached, uh, you know, today with uh, with search. Right? If you look at this Khan Migo, it is an application from this uh, Khan uh, Education EdTech software. So the learning is through a conversation. So there is a way that conversation can stimulate your learning. Right? So it's not just search results. So you as a student ask something and the conversation has to take you on a journey, right? Stimulate your right brain cells and, you know, uh, somebody has to choreograph that conversation and take it along. So, so this, you know, takes the search to a completely new level and we are riding this wave at, at Kindrill and, and I'll uh, demonstrate that in the next few charts. The second one, right, first search, second one is around code generation. So for code generation, I've called out three or four, uh, you know, bullets. So one of the things that we are good at in Kindle is deploying infrastructure, right? So, so for example, edge infrastructure, uh, consider the containerized edge. And, and the, uh, an example is coming. So containerized edge is infrastructure as code, right? So now you use the generative AI technology to automatically generate that infrastructure as code, complex deployments become low touch. And that is uh, one of the things that are core to our business. Um, another thing is test script generation. So now in many projects, we no longer have, uh, you know, testing in our budgets, right? When, because uh, test augmentation is done really well in, in several cases by, by generative AI, that is second. The third is software generation. So in a, in a limited sense, uh, with, you must have seen the profusion of coding assistance and AI software companions and so on. So to, to, to a limited extent, uh, software generation is, is also part of this. And the third thing is, let's say um, you have an analytical query. Yeah, so, so for example, you ask uh, a generative AI chatbot, which is the batsman between, so Brian Lara was there, some technical question like that, between uh, uh, 2000 and 2010 uh, from England who hit the maximum number of uh, half centuries. So, see, to answer this question, your question has to be first converted into a database query. Like, so if, if all this data is in, in a SQL language, a complex query has to be generated. 
So these generative AI large language models are very good in converting analytical questions into these SQL database queries and then plugging them onto vast databases, huge data sets, right, and coming out with answers. So, and this database query statements is also code. So all of this is, a, is the second facet where we are focusing on and, and getting, uh, you know, good results. But of course, all of this, none of this is without risk. Infrastructure as code, if that is generated by AI, there is risk of technical debt because if you don't understand the code that is being generated, you would spend more time in actually maintaining it, right? And then um, uh, maintaining it through the life cycle. And overall, as AI, as we all know, there is also a dark side, right? So AI can be your friend, it can be your companion, but it can also be brutal because it can also be um, uh, uh, a bully, right? And a, and a villain, so to, so to speak, because with generative AI, there are different kinds of threat vectors uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, one has to handle. And regulation is in play. Uh, every enterprise has a governance policy now uh, around generative AI and such. But then, um, you know, lack of regulation can generate hesitation in using these technologies, but one can't wait for regulation to happen. So as a, as a company, one needs lighthouse policies to, to quickly, right? We have to, like I said, India is, can leapfrog with generative AI, so we have to accelerate, not decelerate. So we'll have to find a way around the, the threats, the, the compliance needs, and, and so on and so forth, so that uh, we maximize the benefits with, uh, with these kind of technologies. So with this, I'm going to um, talk about some of the use cases that uh, our company uh, is in the process of implementing, some for internal use cases and some for, for, for our customers. So six of them here, um, spend uh, two minutes each uh, on, on them. See, the first one is, um, is a help desk, an, an AI con set of AI consultants that we use to improve our internal um, incident handling capabilities. So as a company, we have um, tens of thousands of uh, this infrastructure incident records, root cause analysis documents, and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so we want to arm our consultants and our delivery personnel so that when confronted with a new incident, if they have a set of advisors to choose from who tell them how to solve it. So we have ingested massive amounts of data uh, behind a Gen AI tool. As, as you can see here, we uh, are experimenting with uh, multiple large language models. So this, this uh, set of language models released by Facebook Meta, which is all private GPT. So you don't need to rely on um, an, an, an external uh, multi-tenant uh, language model, as well as the ones from the major hyperscalers like uh, uh, AWS and, uh, and Azure. And uh, we scrub all the uh, sensitive private information from this vast uh, swaths of data so that uh, uh, integrity is uh, maintained. We calculate relevance scores so that the answer, we measure the, the relevance of the estimate, the, the answer to the, the query that was typed and, 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 and such. Uh, now see, this, can, this is the rough architecture, um, lack of time, I will not go into details, but this is a pattern called uh, retrieval um, augmented generation, which can be applied to many businesses. So this data can be replaced by your business data, right? IT ops can be replaced by business ops. So for example, there is a sustainability company who, that came to us and said, we have 50 years of sustainability data. How can I make my consultants sharper? So this is an, an, an answer to, to that, right? So uh, some of the, uh, the insights and the advice that this tool is generating has been nothing short of, uh, you know, amazing. So this is the first one. This is an internal tool which we are also in the process of implementing for some of our customers for their business ops data. So the second one is on, um, you know, the low touch or near zero touch deployment of complex edge infrastructure. So one of the largest banks in India is a customer of Kindrel, where uh, we have um, um, thousands of uh, worker nodes. It's a containerized deployment, so multiple sites, multiple clusters, and, and so forth. So in the old world, you need to hire people who, in this case, since it is the containerized edge, you need to hire people who know uh, Kubernetes, who know containers, who know YAML code, and, and, and so on to deploy each site. Now, the interesting aspect is that each of these sites and clusters have a small differential from each other. They look largely the same, but the number of nodes might be different. The, the IP addresses, so the MAC addresses, so the root passwords, or the DNS addresses could be different, but otherwise, you know, they are the, they are the same. So what we are saying here is that 
you know, given the base configuration of a, a container cluster in this case, conversationally, you don't need high skilled people, lower skilled people, if they can conversationally coax and create and generate the infrastructure as code corresponding to each edge site, that can be ingested into a, into a cluster manager and the deployments can be almost zero touch, right? So which is, a, which is a revolutionary change in the cost model because now the cost of deployment is no longer proportional to the number of edge nodes. So the math is completely different. So if you, if you needed 10 people earlier with you know, big skills around containers, now you may need only, you may make do with nine people who are less skilled and just one person to verify, inspect the output of uh, what these tools generate to make sure that the tools do not hallucinate, right? So there are some examples here, um, uh, won't go into the details, but this is something that we have ingested into a Kindle offering now um, and uh, uh, using worldwide. Now the third example um, is around uh, hyperscalers and um, as, as we all know, cloud adoption has accelerated, the, the, the cloud landing zone designs are commonplace, um, you know, today. So now there is um, the old way or the current way of uh, instantiating a complex cloud environment is speak with the customer, understand requirements, create a, uh, you know, low level document, create a build sheet that contains all the hyperscaler resources, and then the, the deployment engineer goes to the cloud portal and provisions all of that, right? Time consuming, not DevOps friendly, error prone, list of, uh, you know, disadvantages, can't scale, right? So now with Gen AI, uh, you know, see the magic that can happen with uh, uh, the, the Gen AI technologies. So now the old way of doing things and compare that with the new way. In the new way, natural language queries are used to declare what you need, right? And then the corresponding infrastructure is code based on the hyperscale. It could be a cloud formation grammar if it is AWS, it could be Bicep if it is Azure, it could be Terraform. Otherwise, right, if it is a VMware a technology and so on. So based on the hyperscaler in question or the target in question, the code, the infrastructure as code automatically gets generated. So it is really English as a programming language in this case. So you can either configure, so here in this example, um, the admin wants to change the number of days of retention in an object store uh, to a different number of days. So earlier you have to go configure you fiddle around with esoteric infrastructure as code files and so on. Now this is just in English, you type and then uh, what you declare um, gets uh, uh, converged into the physical deployment, right? So uh, we are using this uh, for several of our customers. So many of our customers have very complex cloud deployments. For example, we recently we moved two banks in Europe, lock, stock and barrel, shutting down their data centers and offices and into the cloud, one on AWS and, and one on Azure. So in these kind of complex deals, where there are hundreds of thousands of uh, uh, compute and data on, on the cloud, the, the, the power of uh, generating automatically uh, infrastructure as code based on natural language is really, uh, you know, riveting is, is, is what we have seen so far. So this is the, the, the third example, um, you know, I had. Fourth is um, a client use case, an interesting one. We are doing um, a learning management system for a, a large uh, university in, in India. And one of the problems that they have is, um, so they, they have thousands of students, literally uh, about 60,000 students for their online programs. And the, the greatest hurdle for them to scale is actually correction of exam questions, right? It's not uh, every other scaling problem is solved digitally through cloud and, and software. But correction of exam questions, where the exam questions are not multiple choice questions, right? Non-MCQ. So UGC says that 20% of the questions in certain courses like MCA and MCOM and such have to be descriptive in nature, cannot be multiple choice. So in these cases, how do you automate the correction of these questions? That was the problem on the table. And the other speciality is that unlike multiple choice questions, here you have to assign fractional marks. So it could be between zero and a five based on how good your answer is. And then it has to be fair across thousands of students, right? It can't be uh, based on some corner case, you can't assign, you know, unfair marks. So uh, you need high degree of uh, precision as well. So here also, um, we are uh, leveraging uh, uh, large language models and, and generative AI. So here is an example of uh, the question here is in a computer algorithms course, what is the difference between a stack and a queue in computer programming, right? So uh, students type in data and then you know, in this case, it says your, your score is you know, three out of a five and so on. So um, these, these, this family or this class of um, 
uh, algorithms um, is is helping helping us uh, helping some of these industries really really scale because in the case of online education the number of students is doubling every quarter in the offline education the number of students were doubling once every four years so in order to support that kind of scale you need you know these kind of technologies again gives an example of how india can leapfrog right even if you don't have deep ai skills with large language models with some programming acumen you can solve such complex problems right so this is the fourth example Another one I have is in the previous panel, one of the panelists um, uh, alluded to this as well. So there was a customer of ours who, who came and said, um, you know, uh, it's a microfinancing customer. They said, help our uh, CFO to uh, uh, figure out the sentiment of uh, my company, right? And uh, the moment of uh, stock prices. So this solution actually pulled uh, in, in under a week. Um, so what it does is, First of all, it builds a knowledge base of, of our customer in question, about 100 documents in a time series database, right? It's a, there are several time series databases, so in a time series database. And then we use a, a text summarization model to summarize each of these uh, documents. And then we use another model, which is good in financial NLP. So many of these uh, regular models like uh, OpenAI's uh, generative uh, GPT models, are good in English, but they may not be good in financial lingo, right? So there is a model released by Google called BERT, and then there is an open source uh, financial NLP model on top of BERT called FinBERT, which is which understands SEC languages, which understands stock filings. So sometimes some of these um, financial uh, uh, news can be very very confusing, right? Uh, recently, I saw uh, um, you know about a company in the in the title it said uh, uh, you know the the stock is growing like crazy, and then there was a column and said, don't buy the stock, right? So it can be confusing. And, and the EBITDA is different from um, the, the gross profit and, um, and, and losses and, and so forth. So this model understands all of that. So a combination of all of this, a time series uh, uh, database, uh, summarization models, and financial NLP models, in just about a week, we were able to do a sentiment analysis. And this is the sentiment analysis over time, right, across 2018 to 2023. This is how the, the, the sentiment of that customer has moved, the positive, negative, and neutral sentiments. So, so this is only tip of the iceberg, and uh, uh, we're doing several other things as well for uh, the CFO persona, um, you know, in this case. This is another example. And my final example is the one that I briefly alluded to earlier, which is using um, large language models to generate database queries automatically. Right? Like, for example, if you have, like I mentioned, the, the cricket data, but you, you could have demographic data about India huge tables or sustainability data, right, um, which would have tens of thousands of rows that you fill in NoSQL databases on cloud, right, Google BigQuery or Amazon DynamoDB and, 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 and so forth. Now, how do you usefully answer a, a question in natural language or conversation leveraging all this data? It's not easy, right? So you have to look at this data, understand the rows, the columns, the joins, and generate the right query which is what some of these models do with very high accuracy. There is a model called Code Llama from Meta, which can do exactly this, and then convert the query that you typed there, right? Uh, you know, for, for, for example, the, uh, the state of Uttar Pradesh, for example, is the fifth biggest in the world in terms of population, right? Um, so if you want to, to query certain, uh, you know, s statistics around the, the land records, right, in uh, this east of India and so on, the natural language query gets automatically converted to these queries and then the answer, lo and behold, it, it comes out. So this is the, 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 the last example I had. So now, just to conclude um, and summarize, <coughs> see, this is um, a game-changing technology, right? This is not just um, about productivity improvements anymore. This is about um, creative improvements, right? It's about increase in creativity, new business models, right? And this is really um, a disruptive technology. and um, we are seeing intelligent applications that were not possible earlier. So, for example, um, based on the sentiment of the query, can your response change, right? So, so if somebody types in an angry note, um, and if you are a customer service, can your response be aware of the, of this, the sentiment of the input? Or, um, um, you know, other examples being um, um, based on the, the role of the person in a company, for example, if an ordinary employee asks a question to the bot about compensation, maybe the bot will say, 
it doesn't know. But if you log in as an HR and type the same query, you get a different, uh, you know, different kind of an answer, uh, either based on your role or, or an image and so on. And multi-model images are the, the new big thing, right? So a combination of text, image, video, code, you know, all of that together, right? There are, there are models uh, available to do, you know, all of that. Um, so the uh, the software, the intelligent applications of today have started. So this is all GA now. This is all real, right? Um, in production. Um, and then the other thing is uh, AR VR with generative AI. So many uh, many of a company, for example, Kawasaki Motors is a customer of Kindle's Kindle, and we have created an AR VR avatar of a um, of a bot for them. And uh, the bot answers uh, questions uh, riding on generative AI. Right? So. Um, so, and then there is the rise of autonomous agents, which takes things to a whole new level, which would um, uh, give you advice even before you ask questions based on it, what it sees as a, a behavioral pattern and such. So, in short, to conclude, um, uh, exciting times, I think we are all lucky that uh, we are in, 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 this, uh, in this era, and especially so uh, in India, uh, where uh, if we ride this wave, we will we can become the um, in the the, the top uh, uh, economy in the world and uh, lift vast swaths of the population from poverty so there is a direct correlation between these technologies and the citizenry of india so thanks this is what i wanted to cover well this had been as i had vouched for it earlier that this had been one of the most interesting sessions uh, of the day uh, and I'm glad that uh, literally people were filling in. Thank you so much for joining all of you and at this point of time I would now like to welcome yet again the advisor of Infocom and of ABP Private Limited Mr. K.K. Mahapatra yet again on stage to felicitate, show our love and respect and gratitude to Mr. Venkateshwaran and may I please request each one of you to kindly put up your hands together Make it large. Well, any questions, if there is any, you have. So we, ha we have questions, if you would want to take it. So, hi. Two questions. First, my understanding is when you create a new AI model, you need to train it with some data. Now, if there isn't any data, so your assumptions are all about clients who've got data, but you may not have data. So how do you resolve that? That's the first question. Uh, and then I'll go okay. to the second. So see, um, see, the difference between foundational models that have come with this generative AI, large language models, and the regular ML models is that these generative models have already been trained with uh, vast swaths of data, right? and uh, at least in certain areas. And then you only need to fine tune them. So to fine tune in the earlier era with ML, you needed tens of thousands of uh, length of data sets. Today with foundational models, even with hundreds of elements, you are able to get good results. Even though that is not a sweeping statement, that is the, the major difference is that you don't need that much data because in today's world, you fine tune, you don't train. The training is done by, uh, as part of the foundational thing. But again, for some of the models I told you, uh, where there's retrieval augmented, say for example, if you want to, to build a chat bot that would sit on top of your business ops data, and then give you insights and cognitive advice on top of it, zero in, zero out, right? Garbage in, garbage out. Unless you give it the business ops data, and if you want to ring fence the advice just to your data, then obviously you need the data. Otherwise, for many use cases, you don't need that much data. Second question was regarding sentiment analysis. Now, you Regarding? the sentiment analysis yeah, yeah. screen that yeah. you had up there, you know, where you talked about the financial uh, yes. data uh, for your client. Yeah. Now, sentiment analysis that you were running was on their data, was it? And was it based on text analysis or NPS or what kind of methodology? So, so this was on publicly available data. So for this customer, we were able to scrape 100 documents from the web. Okay, yeah, because the publicly available tools have that restriction. That's why I asked this question. Yeah, so it's all publicly available data. Mm. Optionally, we can also get uh, real-time RSS feeds, Twitter feeds, and so on and so forth. Twitter but feeds don't give you enough data because they uh, yeah. restrict it. 
Yeah, so in this case, we got about uh, 100 documents from the institute. Regarding that uh, use case where you showed answers, numbers, other marks provided ah, to... Yes. Yeah? yes. Uh, what, was the, uh, what was the data provided? The right answer, which the, probably the model understands and figures out, okay, is the, uh, what are the answer giver providing the muta muta similar kind of an... Is something like this happening? So very, very interesting question. So twofold, um, uh, two pronged attack there. One is we feed them. So this particular thing was computer algorithms, right? That is the the test is on computer algorithms. So the model is given textbooks like the Corman's book and so on, and it understands, right? It, it, we, we ring fence. This is number one. Books, it's a number one. No, so that is the second prong. Second prong is, and again, this is a research area, so there's no right answer. But the, the second approach is that, let's say 5,000 students took that exam, right? Now, let us say I have hun, say, N professors who can look at the data, N much, much less than this 5,000. So I would first collect all these answers and cluster them into N, into N buckets. And the center of these, each of these N buckets, I'll give to a live professor and ask him to mark that, right? And then store that and the rest, I would calculate a semantic similarity with that. Right? So there are multiple approaches to, to this. <laughs> but not as complicated as solving this problem without large language models and, and generative AI. Now we have that, right? So it becomes good programming acumen and, you know, um, reasonably good programming skills. You don't have to be an ML company in order to solve these problems. So. Yeah, it, it, yes. Excuse me. Uh, yes. Sir. One thing has been observed, you know, that uh, these large language models along with the new dimensions of uh, Gen, Gen AI is, you know, giving some average results or near to accuracy results. So it's not exactly the same. So uh, since things are moving, going to be very fast, you know, uh, how much will be the human judgment still, you know, will be applicable? 10%, 20%, 30%, because earlier AIs were 60, 70% accurate. Now Gen AIs, people are saying 80% or above that accuracy is going to come up. So how much uh, still the judgment is going to happen? Because that's extremely important in terms of, uh, say for example, customer acquisition strategy, your supply chain strategy, and many other strategies. So see, uh, see, philosophically, it is said that perfection is logarithmic, right? So if you have one unit of effort to get to a 90% accuracy, you need an, another one unit to go from 90 to 99, another one unit to go from 99 to 99.9, Another, it's like your battery charging, right? So, so it is steep, so you've got to stop somewhere. But a model that gives you an accuracy about 50-60% is a useless model. It, it is, uh, 50 is completely useless, 60-70 uh, is also not a usable model. Uh, see, the, the fundamental thing is that, uh, see, it's a settled fact that verifying the correctness of a problem is easier than solving the problem itself. Right? So now, if somebody purports to solve a problem, and if your, your problem reduces to verifying the correctness of it, you know, in computer science, there's a class of problems, right, where you say that um, if it's a decision problem is much easier than a solving problem. So we are in a territory where things are easier, regardless of whether it is precise or not. Now, there, there has to be multiple techniques to get it. So first of all, you'll have to figure out what is the threshold beyond which uh, correctness, right, in the case of the marking thing, maybe a 95% correctness is needed, otherwise if the model is not fair and if there are corner cases where there is a student that, so in this particular case, is a difference between a stack and a queue, right? A stack follows really a last in first out kind of a mechanism and a queue follows first in first out, that we all know. Now, let us say there are these two answers, last in first out, this is one sentence answer. It can be a paragraph descriptive answer, but in this is one sentence answer. See, from an NLP perspective, it is just two words, first in, last out, and last in, first in. So regular models are going to score the similarity of these two exactly same, while the difference is between a zero marking and a five out of five marking, right? So there are these subtleties where you'll have to fine tune and train and so on. 
no single answer, but for each to push the correctness to acceptable levels, that engineering around it is going. That is the complexity now. I believe uh, no more queries as of now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for this very, very interesting session, I must say.